morning, everyone. Thanks for coming. Welcome to our new and improved space. Definitely have uh, a lot more space and less people crammed into, uh, you know, crammed around. So we'll see how it goes. Um, really excited that everybody's here. A um, couple announcements real quick. Startup Weekends coming up as part of Global Entrepreneurship Week. Everyone should have received a, a, a schedule for all the tentative events. I think there's 30 plus events coming up for the second week of November. Uh, so make sure you start signing up for those now. Um, one event I'd like to highlight, uh, Kansas City's going for the Guinness Book of World Records for the largest networking event um, during that week. So register today. I think we need over 400 people or so uh, to do that. So. Uh, startup weekend. Let's see. Anything else on the board? Remember, it's uh, it's totally fine to have your phone out, your computers out. Tweet at our uh, startups today. We always like to, you know, offer exposure, um, take pictures. Um, these are things that they can use as they go forth, and and they can use the pictures and and the video that we're creating for them. Um, all right. Without further ado, it's always best when I get out of the way as quick as possible. Um, we have Stuart and Dave uh, from RFP365, and uh, they're basically creating intelligent RFP software, and they're going to tell you how it works. Welcome, guys. Thanks, Nate. My name's Dave Hulson. Uh, and I'm Stuart Ludlow. And we are talking about RFP365. So what is an RFP? Uh, for those of you who are not familiar, <coughs> Any, any time an organization goes out into the marketplace to buy something, um, whether it be a good, a service, they want to build something, they need to engage vendors. And an RFP, a request for proposal, is a formal document, a formal process to, uh, to request bids from vendors to compare their capabilities and eventually se uh, select a winner. But what's the problem with RFPs right now? We've been in the business for a long time. Um, RFP issuing process has not evolved, all right? People still push around documents. They use email. They fax. People fax a lot of documents still these days. And they even mail bound copies uh, of, of uh, proposals. Uh, this, is, this is really, it it's ju just hasn't matured. Um, and additionally, there's a lack of side-by-side -side comparison. So it's, it's very difficult in a paper environment to make um, really good comparisons objectively. <clears throat> RFP responders also need productive processes. Uh, knowledge management is critical. Um, imagine imagine your, your organization creating proposals on a daily basis. Uh, where do you save that, that, that information? What happens if the person or the people who create your, your proposals leave the company? Do you lose all that knowledge? Um, and companies are still pushing around multiple versions of documents. Uh, it's a huge hassle. There's a lot of confusion. And lastly, there's no way to track uh, tasks, resources, and time associated with creating proposals responding to RFPs. Welcome to RFP365, a web-based platform to help you issue and respond to RFPs. RFP365 helps procurement teams create RFPs, distribute them to bidders, track the responses, and score results. For responders, RFP365 helps manage proposals, required tasks, and critical company knowledge. RFP365 is an easy-to-use, web-based tool to help you save time, manage resources, and make informed decisions. Visit us today at RFP365.com. So, our product, uh, online software, and what we're doing, instead of just managing an RFP, which is a document, we're managing the process that, that, that goes around how these are created. And the process is very straightforward for any cross-industry. You create one, you send it to people, you get, this, get the results, you score it, and then you figure out what vendor I'm going to choose. So within that process, um, for the creation step, we have like online form collaboration tools. So that way, people in your team can go and define what's in your RFP. Uh, whenever you distribute it, you choose the vendors you want like normal, but you send them an electronic copy as compared to a paper or a Word document over email. Uh, you collect everything the same way um, based on timelines you've set. Uh, scoring is what our biggest offer we're, we're giving to people that issue. So whenever you create your RFP, you define 
what's my really important scoring ability? So if I care about a company's, uh, the length of time they've been in business, um, I can relatively say this is what's important to me in the responses. So whenever you get the responses back, you can distribute across members of your team. They can see one question, they can see the results of all, all, the, all the vendors and they relatively score the results. Uh, this is all done transparently. So you, what it gives us the ability to algorithmically decide why a vendor was chosen as the best vendor for an RFP, which is great for transparent organizations like public sector municipalities. On the responder side, uh, we don't, uh, whenever they get one in, um, right now the big issue is if I get a Word document in, it's, I might need 10 people in my team to actually help work on one RFP, engineering, marketing, sales. Um, so what we do is, since it's all electronic, we give you the ability to uh, break down a question and assign them out throughout different people in your team. Each question has a due date so you can track where things are. And then the, uh, our big technology thing we're building on this side is every question you write gets stored into your own personal search index. And then every question that you're trying to answer, we search it and try and predictively answer questions based on how your company has answered in the past. Most RFPs are about 60 to 70% boiler, boilerplate. And so we're trying to take all those answers and knock them out. And then for the, the knowledge that you've built up over time, uh, if you answered a question a year ago, we try and actually, um, and a similar question comes in, we try and answer that for you. Um, once you do that, uh, you can search, you can write it. We have an approval workflow, and once it's done, you can either spit it out to a Word document for formatting to send to other companies or electronically submit it back. So what this really looks like uh, end to end, which is kind of what we ran through, but this is the process of everything that we're creating. And each step of this, we're defining software and, and uh, to kind of manage each of these steps. All right, we, we look at our um, landscape, our marketplace, with two major uh, verticals, the public sector and the private sector. And on the far right, there's a specialized industry, some specialized groups we're going to exclude right now. But we have, uh, there are some software vendors that play in these spaces. Uh, in the least mature space at the bottom there is uh, software notification providers, or RFP no notification pr providers. They simply have services that tell the world that RFPs have been made, made available by public institutions. Moving up, up the chain, our most um, popular com uh, competitor are RFP portal and document uh, management providers. These, these software companies uh, allow issuers the ability to post documents or bid packets um, on, uh, on a website or portal so that bidders and vent vendors can pull down these packets, fill them out, and mail them back in but all they do is facilitate the transfer of those documents. Proposal creation software companies uh, uh, have some da database, some search uh, capabilities. They help track tasks and, and help people, help business development teams create RFPs or create uh, proposals more quickly. And finally, electronic platforms. Uh, these are really end-to-end -end, uh, electronic pla platforms, but as you can see, they're, they're owned by Oracle and SAP which means that they're, they're modules of big R, um, ERP type systems. So the IT infrastructure costs are very high. Where RFP 365 fit, fits in, bridges the gap be between the public sector and the private sector uh, groups. And it, it supports both the issuers and the responders of, R, R, of R, RFPs. The biggest benefit in this sector is that small businesses have, a, have the ability, we've enabled small businesses to, more, to, to compete more, more efficiently with these RFPs that are issued by federal, state, local governments, nonprofits, and educational institutions. So we're getting ready to launch here. And uh, what we're looking for as we um, launch in the next month are issuers and responders of, of RFPs. So that would be pr uh, procurement teams or business development con contacts that regularly work with RFPs, um, both in the private and public sector. So that's it for our presentation. <coughs> All right, guys, let's open up for questions. Um, let's try and get mic'd up. I know there's one here and uh, maybe one more mic floating around. So I'll be the front if anybody, I'll be the front runner. Go ahead, ask away.
so my question would be, you said, you mentioned at the end, RFP 365 kind of helps those government agencies, education and stuff, work with those small businesses. Uh, how big of a problem is it right now that they kind of just have maybe four or five people that they've worked with before that they send to the same, the same RFP to all the time? And then uh, is that kind of what they're comfortable with? How easy would it be for them to break out of that and start working with those small businesses? That's a great qu question. We're, we're hearing from um, municipalities especially that say that uh, they need to increase the network of people that respond to their RFPs. So they're seeing the same vendors, whether they be construction projects around town. It's the same people who have these relationships. They've, they've figured out how to make good bids to, to these organizations. Um, we met with uh, the, the uh, GSA uh, last, last month. They have, they have, at the federal level, a need to engage small businesses. They have a mandate to engage small businesses. But uh, it's very difficult to do that because the barrier to entry for many small businesses is, is, is high. When you've got all this paperwork and red tape associated with responding to an RFP, we've looked at RFPs that are 50 pages long, yet only maybe two pages of those are actual questions. The rest of it are contracts you have to read and accept and uh, forms you've got to fill out. We believe that you should never have to fill out the same thing twice. Once you've answered it, we store it in the database, we, 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 the search index will find it and offer it up the next time and say, hey, you've already answered a question like, like this. Do you want to use this answer? Yeah, awesome, great. Maybe make a small edit and you're ready to go. Does that, does that answer your yeah, question? Sure. Thanks. Other questions? What made you decide to effectively create two pretty different products? Even though they're both RFP centered, it, it seems like they're they're very different. And the uh, the vendor, or I'm sorry, not the vendor, the the sourcing uh, focused product seems fairly similar to uh, to Ariba. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Ariba was. I think Ariba was on our when we talk about our platform solution back. Um, Ariba was at, up top. Um, so the first question we answered was why we do both. So in any transaction, there's, a, there's a two parties involved. Um, and most software now either focuses on, I want to figure out a way to issue RFPs. I don't really care how you respond to it. Just however you do it internally, here's a Word document, figure it out. Or those focus on responders who say, I don't really care about how it's issued to me. I just want to be able to manage a few things. And what we found was, A, <clears throat> you need to look at them collectively. So if I'm issuing out a proposal, I want to know that the people who are bidding are giving me the best foot that, that they have forward. I want to not only make it easy, you know, I want to be able to say, I want as many people as I can bid, and I want to be able to handle that information quickly, and I want the best information that they can give me. So if I don't care about the other side, me as an issuer, I think I'm get getting fewer and less quality of uh, proposals back. Um, and so that's why we're like, you need both sides, we're trying to focus on both. So we can market to each individually, but the product itself handles both sides. I'd like to follow up also with um, Ariba uh, is really good for commodities. So um, when, you're, when you're competing solely on price, um, Ariba does, does a great job. If you're a big company and you're trying to source tables and chairs and toilet paper and all that kind of stuff and light bulbs, it's great. Um, what we're focusing on are qualitative RFPs and responses. So service providers, um, questions that, that need, that, that, that the answers are open-ended questions. You know, uh, tell, tell me about how you would implement this. Where, where have you done this before? And not just how much does it cost for, you know, a truckload of nails. Um, and, and so um, the, it's not, it's not cut and dry. It's not a request for quote system necessarily. It's a request for proposal that may be a more in-depth answer. Yeah, so you may Thank you. Thank you. It, it looks good. Thank you. When responding to when responding to RFPs in the past, I often would put together a large team of people, sometimes virtually. Tell me a little bit more from the responder side about how your software enables teams to work more efficiently on maybe customizing some of those boilerplate documents. Um, how how does that work? Um. So I heard two different questions. One, how does a team work collectively? Uh, and so if I have, 
So in RFP, conceptual models, I have sections and I have questions. Some sections have text or files to, to look through or a bunch of questions in them. So our software looks at those questions individually and you can assign a, a question out to anyone in your company with due dates on them that are based on when the proposal is due or when that task can be due. And then you can track and see where everything is. In addition, everything um, in terms of documents you write, we have a, like a, a big template library to which um, you could create one big template of all your stock, um, company overview, executive summaries, stuff like that. And that is always stored and that always will get generated on your behalf. Um, can everyone hear me? Okay. Um, can you guys talk about a little bit about your entrepreneurial journey and, and maybe as individuals and how you guys met to become like co-founders? Uh, Dave and I met uh, our freshman year of college. Um, nice. I'm going to date myself but 18 years ago um, at Mizzou um, and we've been friends ever since. Um, I've had my own company for nine years. I have another software company um, right now that uh, I had a consulting company and another software company. Um, so I've kind of been in the small business space for a while, not in the, uh, different than being, I think, in the, in the entrepreneurial space. Um, but Dave and I were on a motorcycle trip in Southeast Vietnam in January, and I think we had a lot of time to we were just on a bike for 8 to 10 hours a day, and I think uh, we separate talked... Bikes. Separate bikes, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we, we had the idea, we kicked it around for a while, and I think uh, on that trip we kind of solidified that it, was, it could be a fun thing to work on. Um, we so Dave still has a full-time job, we've been doing this um, uh, kind of on the side, uh, bootstrapped, getting forward, um, and that's kind of my background. I'm fairly new to, to the, the startup space. Um, I've been in IT consulting since uh, kept coming out of college. I've taken some, some breaks. Um, actually worked as a teacher through uh, on the other side of the Kaufman uh, build, build, building here, uh, the Kaufman Teaching Fellows. So I taught high school for, for a couple of years. Um, and, uh, but anyway, this is really exciting for us. Uh, we've, we, we have both been involved with RFPs, issuing for on behalf of our clients or responding um, on behalf of our clients, and uh, you know we tossed this around a, over a year ago, where we were like, man, there's just not, there are just aren't good tools for us to use. Especially, I mean, there are some expensive tools out there, but for for small businesses and for just you know you you you, you need to do one RFP, whatever, and not you you don't have a whole department full full of them. How can somebody just go out there and be up and running within 15 minutes? And that's what software as a service allows us using the cloud. There's no installation. There's hardly any training. We don't have many screens to use. Stu's done a great job, and we've we've hired some great uh, some great talent around to help us design and build out the the application. So it looks great. What's the, what's the cost? The question is, what does it cost? Um, well, we we have tiered pricing, um, uh, as you would expect. Um, our our most expensive per RFP price is $79. Um, and then uh, there are some packages that you can lower your cost per R RFP, but um, you might have a $99 or $199 hosting fee for the, the organizations that create more data. But um, as far as um, the value for that, I mean, um, when we look at some of the organizations that, uh, that have big staff, I mean, they might have 20 people that work on, on RFPs. So we also have to be very flexible. When, we, when we're crossing that public-private sector, the public sector, if they're issuing out RIPs, may ha have, to have a zero barrier of entry for responders. So in that case, the burden of payment is on an issuer, whereas in the private world, if you're issuing out, you may want to actually add a barrier of entry for responders. So we have to um, let the issuers decide. Real quick, um, I'm just kind of cur cur curious. How many people out there have ever worked with RFPs before? If you just raise your hand or clap. Okay, that's good. That's what we, I mean, especially when we meet uh, people, uh, there's like this younger generation of like startup people that, that have no clue what an RFP is. My sister, even after watching the videos, has no clue what an RFP is. Um, but people that have been in the business world know, hopefully, 
um, I mean, uh, you, you know the pain and whatever. So we, um, we'd love to hear from anybody because uh, we, we, we continually are developing new features and functionality. So um, any input you have, you can drop us an email or send us a, a Twitter, however that works. I'll, I'll figure it out. <laughs> Toby, we'll be talking afterwards. I, I have a Social question. Social media consultant. Just, just one question, quick question. I've been dealing with RFPs for a long time, and it seems like people issuing RFPs have always wanted, you know, their highest priority was to level the playing field, whereas the people responded wanting to, were wanting to be, to stand out, to, you know, to show their additional value, like you mentioned, things like that. Are there opportunities in the response to make yourself, to make your response unique or anything like that, or is it, does it just come out in a wash? Uh, right now, um, right now, if it's issued from our system, um, everything is coming back. We are more concerned with the issuer being uh, completely trans, like even level playing field. When you're scoring, you don't know who you're scoring. You're actually just scoring a response. I like this, I don't. So it's completely transparent from the issuing side. But from the responders, uh, we give you the ability to add extra information. And so what we do is you can create additional sections of c very company specific information that aren't related to what was issued. And in there you can attach you can add you can add text you can add your own questions and answers or you can add files of like you know case histories which are all those can be prettied up to whatever degree you need yeah and to add on that i mean the the additional files <laughs> that people add can be can be pictures video links and stuff so so you can sell 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 it yourself but you have to do it within the confines of the of the, the of the rules that the rfp issuer has laid out sir Thanks. Can you just share a little bit about uh, your market penetration strategy and maybe the phasing of how you're planning on introducing and growing? Wow, uh, we we didn't even we didn't even practice that question with you, um, but we have that here. Um, so our marketing approach is uh, it's three threefold. Um, we we have our our target issuers here that we've been we've been talking with. Various levels of government, uh, some nonprofit organizations, and trying to get into the educational sector. Um, these are going to there. There is just a huge, a huge amount of RFPs that are issued there. So, um, but the barrier, uh, the barrier for us is these are government organizations. They're not necessarily known for their 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 innovation. So, so we're it's going to be a little bit. There's going to be some learning on our part in selling to these guys. Um, the, the, the target responders um, are, I mean, we're looking at you know, the six million small businesses out there that want a piece of this. So one of the good things that we're, that we're attempting to offer, or that we do offer, is that these, whether or not the RFPs are issued through here, responders can still use RFP 365 to manage that information to store their data in the repository, to use the, uh, the intelligent search so they can create pr proposals more, more efficiently. While we're trying to get relationships with these, these big organizations. And then last, lastly, um, we've got some, some ideas of some, str uh, some str strategic partners we'd like to maybe private label things with before, um, in the coming years. Do you want to add anything? Does that answer do you have a, a follow-up on that? Well, I mean, I I say, well, I'm, I'm always curious for a little bit more detail uh, yeah. because I mean, you could start with all or you could phase it with some priorities knowing that once you have one side as bait, you can get the other. So it's just, I yeah. mean, you don't necessarily even have to charge necessarily as you're building your initial community base. The, the, correct, correct. Yes. And so, so we know direct sales people, pe people feet on the ground, when we talk about selling, we're only focusing on issuers. For every one, every issuer, whether it's public or private, we don't really care. Because for every issuer we get, they could, if they send it out to 10 vendors, we, we just got 11 people on our system. Those vendors are going to answer, use our system, if the issuer says, you have to respond in this format. And so, um, so in terms of penetration, that's our strategy of, of the people and manpower we have is focusing on that. That being said, we're kind of using the web we have to focus and to gear stri strictly for those who respond. The, the, the number of people who respond to RFPs just happens to be a lot larger than the people who issue. Um, and so our, our web strategy is for responders, our direct sales force is for those who issue, um, and then 
I mean, that's basically how we're splitting up our time. So we're not saying they don't, I mean, there's always crossover on each side, but that's basically what we're focusing on. Uh, my questions, I think the only thing that sucks worse than doing them is when you lose them. And I had success of re asking if I could see the other RFPs, and I, sometimes I would be able to get those and go through them. Is there anything that helps note why you lost or track the other you, old FRP or see the yes. winning FRP and go, what they do different? And so whether Thank if it's you. political or technical or... It's a great question. And I'll just... One of the major things um, that we kind of came across as we were... Because we're, we're working with data now instead of documents, uh, we have all of the responses and how they were scored. So as the, as the search engine goes through and looks for uh, uh, old questions, it says, you know, how many people are in your company? Well, this is how we answered the question last time, or, or um, how would you implement this? Um, if that response was scored well, the search engine gives a relevancy ranking to that that's higher than other uh, similar answers. So, so you... Yeah. I was sorry to interrupt, but... Uh, you know, at the end of once a vendor, once a someone who issued an RFP chooses a vendor, all that scoring data, uh, we we're giving it the power of the issuer if they want to give it back. But all that data gets sent back to the responders. So what that does it gives the responders the ability of saying, "This is what you scored low at, either because it's written poorly or you as a company don't perform this well." So it gives the responders the ability to look and kind of say, well, as a company, do I want to focus more on this, or do I just need to completely rewrite this question for future, for future work? So, so we can kick, kick this off automatically to, to, you know, to send out um, the scoring summary to vendors and, see, and let them know how they did, how they, how they, they ranked, and where they, where they can improve. <clears throat> All right, I'm going to take the last question. Um, so you guys talked a little bit about what you need. I mean, you're, you're, uh, you're a month out from launching, um, so I assume you're asking, you know, you need customers, but uh, what else can we do as a community to support you? And, I mean, do you need a launch party? Do you need, I don't know, like a, you know, whatever. Just, uh, I mean, feel free to ask it now. Gosh, that's a good question. We, we, um, we want to be... Um, we want to be the RFP platform for Kansas City. Um, before we take this anywhere else, before we would try to grow in any other market, um, that's, we've been working with um, local governments here, uh, both at the municipality level, um, had, a, had some initial interest from, from the GSA for the region here, um, whether it be educational institutions, nonprofits, um, we, helping the small business community especially land more RFPs, uh, land more work through our RFPs benefits the whole, the whole community. So we're just asking for, um, for you guys to use us. And we think that the value is, we believe the value is there, we believe the price is low. So feel, feel free to ch check us out and send us communication, whatever, just, c just consider us. Know, know, that there's a, uh, know that there's a platform out there that'll help you. Awesome, let's give them a big round of applause. All right, as usual, we're going to take a short break, but uh, during the break, try and meet somebody new. I know it's really easy to, uh, to kind of stick with your normal groups, but try and meet uh, at least one new person. Uh, we'll be back here in three minutes. A couple quick announcements. <laughs> this, is, this is real chest hair, folks. Real dedication. Um, all right, we have Matthew Marcus. Um, He's going to talk to you a little bit about uh, the Homes for Hacker initiative that's going on and the uh, Kansas City Startup Village. Go ahead and tell him what you're up to. First of all, I should have asked the question to RFP 365. How is their solution going to bring back mood rings, smoke machines, and mirrored balls? Really? That's the solution we need. So, yeah, uh, Kansas City Startup Village is happy to announce that uh, Ben Barrett has secured his first uh, Homes for Hackers uh, home. Which is awesome. Uh, I believe we've already got two hackers living in there and on a bed with a microwave. That's all they have in there. So, uh, anyway, uh, so he closed yesterday, and this Saturday we are having a huge uh, cleanup session. Clean up the yard, do some painting, some you know fixing up around the way. 
so we've got some sign-up sheets here. Uh, it's just over at, um, you can meet at 4454 State Line. That's where the local ruckus leap to and form Zapper House is. Um, and he's just about five houses away. So if you uh, have some spare time, we'd love to, you know, and you got, you're willing to help, we'd love to have you over there. Um, you know, we've got, bring some rakes or whatever you got. Um, yeah, lunch will be provided, and uh, there'll be some fun, too. I think they're going to head to the park afterwards and have a little informal Ultimate Frisbee throwing session, so that'll be good times. And uh, anything else that people need to bring? Or? Yeah, um, we, uh, you know, rakes and different things. We're actually, we have a list up on, and I'll write it up here, kcsv.org of things, furnishings for the house that we're looking for. I mean, literally the house has nothing. So we got a few mattresses, like you said, we got a desk. We're just kind of collecting what we can. Um, but um, if you're interested in helping out, I'll put that information up here and just sign your name and we'll send out an email to try and coordinate everybody. But this is very much a, kind of an ad hoc thing we're doing. What yep. is the objective for Homes for Hackers? Excuse me? What is the objective for Homes for Hackers? Um, if you're not familiar with Homes for Hackers, uh, Ben Barrett decided to start it. Um, and then decided to spend his own money to buy a house, but it's just an initiative to get um, programmers from anywhere uh, the ability to develop on Google Fiber. Uh, since it's a residential service, you can't get it as a business. And so his solution was find people that are willing to open up their house for free for three months at a time to programmers to develop on this technology that nobody else in the world has. And he went in full, uh, full bore and spent his own money to buy a house, which is pretty awesome. Um, so anyways, that he closed <coughs> on it yesterday. And um, so Mike, <laughs> Mike D, the first guy in from Boston, moved in um, yesterday night. So he was really stoked. But um, so anyways, yeah, I'll write up the information here and just pass if you're interested in helping out. We'll just put the information out. But literally, we're just trying to get in and uh, get them up and running. Now's a good time to clean out your garage and uh, you know all that empty that stuff you want to get rid of. We'll Awesome. So, I mean, when we ask the question, how do we get more companies to start in Kansas City? It's organic initiatives like this. The fact that four entrepreneurs from outside of Kansas City are coming to Kansas City to start companies here is pretty amazing. And, and the, the leadership that Ben has taken um, has been awesome. So we'd, we'd love to have you out for an hour or if you want to drop off a microwave or whatever. Um, the list is, uh, we'd love to have your help. And then one last time, I hope everybody got a schedule for Global Entrepreneurship Week. If you didn't get one, we have plenty up here. Come and get one afterwards. Um, but let me introduce our second entrepreneur. I'm really excited. I met Pac through Prentice, who is our entrepreneur in residence. And um, he's like, you got to meet this guy. He's invented this like new chair called the Soul Seat. And I'm like, sounds cool. And um, I, I spent a lunch uh, learning from PAC um, basically about the importance of good posture and about how, you know, if you sit at your computer all day long and you sit in your car and then you go home, you sit at the kitchen table and then you sit on the couch and even if you exercise regularly, you, you still are, um, you can hurt your health that way. And so I, we've been joking, but it's true that sitting is the new smoking. And not in a cool way. It's like a, <laughs> so, <laughs> so anyway, um, he's got plenty of chairs. He's just going to tell you all about it. Everybody, welcome, Pack Matthews. Thanks so much, Nate. Am, am I on? Okay. So, um, my name is Pack Matthews, and uh, this is our invention. Um, we, in the interest of uh, Dressing up for Halloween, we brought a dressed up soul seat. I just pulled my wire out. <laughs> so this is a heart-shaped soul seat, um, all dressed up for Halloween. We, uh, uh, I'd like to in start by just thanking Nate and the whole Kauffman Foundation um, for all their initiatives. Things like the Silicon Prairie uh, Network has been really valuable to me as an independent um, inventor and, and uh, entrepreneur. I want to, we've got several members of our team here. Um, we've got Gene Gerke here with Gerke Associates. He's joined us about six months ago to help with strategy and business development. Um, over here is Jim Santilli, who's, he's got uh, Kansas City Upholstery just down the road. He's been really invaluable to us and able to execute this product at a level that um, 
is, is very high, and I didn't imagine be, would be able to do so soon. Um, this is Jennifer Bailey. She's our patent attorney. Uh, if you need any help with patents, uh, she took a risk on a, an unknown, un, uh, never before patented, independent, no corporate help inventor. And we just published yesterday uh, the patent number is 8,297,706. <laughs> A four-year process. Uh, Jennifer's been with us from the very get-go. And last but not least, uh, my wife, Rebecca Graves, um, early uh, beta tester, um, still using hers at work every day. And uh, she does the big work of living with a crazy maker 24-7. So what you're looking at is uh, a new paradigm in sitting. Um, it completely re... Uh, organizes the whole notion of ergonomics. When we started this um, three years ago, we assumed that we would be um, selling into a niche market of yoga uh, practitioners, Pilates practitioners, dancers like Ryan here. And that was going to be fine. It was going to be a small market. And it was going to uh, cash flow just fine. Only uh, about two years ago, as Nate mentioned, there's been some research coming down the pike. It's been one of the best global education campaigns that we could have dreamed of. Um, and now we find that our primary market is folks like Laura Schaaf here, who's a director of wellness at MU. Her Aeron chair sits neglected in the corner. She won't sit on it. She only sits on her sole seat. She loves it so much she had us produce a, um, a slip cover made out of sheepskin. So it's, it's really gorgeous. Um, so, a year ago I was joking that sitting is the new smoking. Well now if you Google, is sitting the new smoking, you'll get lots and lots of hits, lots of um, research that shows that if you spend, um, and here's, a, here's the latest Lancet, uh, this summer came out in July, this was not just America, this is a global, this was results of a global meta-analysis um, that Sedentary lifestyles are equivalent to smoking and obesity in terms of your health risk for uh, chronic disease. Um, and some of this early research came right out of MU. A guy named um, Mark Hamilton, he did some research. He identified the lip, uh, lipase in, enzyme that shuts down when you've been sitting more than 20 minutes. And what he figured out was that if you, if you work for eight hours and then you commute for two hours, even if you're at the gym, every additional hour, you can't make up for the, the damage you do from being sedentary. And so right now we're working on setting up some clinical trials to see how active is sitting on a sole seat. Is there, and some initial studies have shown that there's, um, it's, it's equivalent and close to standing. So um, what is ergonomic? Is, is your chair ergonomic if it keeps you comfortable for six hours pain free? Uh, it doesn't encourage you to move. Um, so we need to rethink all these things. Uh, and people aren't waiting to find out the answers. This fellow is at, at Hallmark. He's done basically what I did initially, bring the floor up to the desk height. He's, um, this was sent to us by, by one of our prospects at Hallmark. Um, this was a hack by, uh, this, is, this picture is in uh, Buenos Aires, Argentina. Our, uh, one of our early customers, Liet Gat, she's in Palo Alto, California. She had her soul seat for two weeks, loved it so much. When she got down to uh, Buenos Aires for a three month working vacation, um, she tried to hack this together to recreate her soul seat experience. That's an iron pot skillet on the floor, Ottoman sitting on top of it. Here she is back home in Palo Alto, um, happily on her soul seat again. She spends you know, hours a day uh, running her knitfreedom.com um, site. So we think our market is the sedentary knowledge worker, and we'd like to discover ways to take advantage of this uh, wave of um, health, this new health climate, this new landscape of research. Um, So we've uh, proven this in the market. We've sold 
uh, roughly 75 units. It's a high dollar unit that uh, competes with you know Aeron shares and 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 more expensive uh, because of the the benefit that it provides. We've shipped uh, as far east as Sweden, uh, north to Canada. Um, we sent parts to Argentina because she wanted to have one produced down there. So we had some experience with distributed manufacturing. Um, it's made uh, wholly here in, in Missouri at this point. Um, local talent around Columbia, Missouri, but also with help from Jim Santilli here in Kansas City. Um, and we've got three questions that we'd like your help with. The first is, how can we become more visible to knowledge workers, um, given that this is our, really our demographic? Um, how can we uh, get the word out? And the next question is, what design issues should we have in mind as we do uh, the next iteration of this chair to provide the chair as a platform for data loggers, um, biosensing, um, positive feedback apps that you could write that would help people, encourage them to keep moving while they're at work. And then the third question is, what I mentioned already, how can we take advantage of this research climate that's this big wave of, of, um, of information that everyone seems to know about. Whenever I ask folks, they seem to know that sitting is the new smoking and they're trying to, do, trying to find solutions for that. And that's all, I'll take some questions now. Um, in response to your question, um, the first one in particular, like, I, I wouldn't go and search for something like this. It just wouldn't, you know, I, I feel comfortable in my chair. Um, sitting on it, it does just feel natural. It feels like I could really get into this. And so the only way I'd be introduced to it is coming here. So, you know, getting a, like Kaufman to say, okay, we're going to get rid of all these chairs and not maybe not all of them, but a good amount of them. And, and them here. <laughs> <laughs> just, just to, you know, just, yeah, don't worry. just to get people, because I think that as soon as somebody sits down on it, you know, they're going to be interested in it, and then you, you know, get people going on it. And, you know, right. The, the, so the question was, he w wasn't even aware that he would want to look for something like this. And that, uh, what we found is that people don't even recognize this as a chair. It's so revolutionary. And people do have to sit on it. And, and often, they will project discomfort. But you're completely comfortable, right? Yeah. Um, you should go back and look at what um, happened with the air on chair in like 1993. Because prior to that, it was unheard of to buy a $600 office chair. Yeah. And whatever they did, that took off, took off immensely quickly. Because within a few years, like whole companies were throwing out all their chairs and buying air on chairs. So I don't know what they did, but you should go back and look and see how that how that Good played point. out. Thank you. Thank you. Real quick, Pat. Real quick, can we uh, can we make sure to use the microphones? And two, is there anybody who wants to try it for the first time in out in front of everybody? Here we go. All right. So in the upper part, that's it. And, and you know, keep your shoes up. Don't worry about it. It's tough. I noticed you sat like that and you sat cross-legged. Oh, there are dozens of postures. Yes. I could demonstrate a few more if you like. I didn't want to distract <laughs> myself too much. There, there's an and you can right fold there. your, you can put one knee, put one foot behind you. There you go. And, and you can put the other one too, if you're flexible. Yes. Yeah. All right, sorry. <laughs> Pat, how does the soul seat differ from the swapper and the kneeling chairs and some of the other ergonomic type good, chairs good on question. the market? Okay, so the swapper is based, if you're familiar with the swapper, it's a stool that has a spring loaded and it can swing from side to side. So the swapper lets you do this and it, lets, it gives you the sort of uh, movability of the pelvis. And so that's good and you can, you can get up and stand easily and you can adjust the height. What the swapper doesn't do is let you sit like this. Um, it doesn't let you, uh, sit in all these other postures that help keep the pelvis uh, flexible and, and open and keeps that one of the reasons that the enzyme system shuts down is because the large postural muscles stop working when you sit in a comfy chair and so these chairs like the swapper and the soul seat keep keep all that active the nice thing about the soul seat is you it also keeps the uh, thighs pronated which is the ab I mean abducted adducted, open, 
which is the way you sit on the floor is that your, your femur is pointing out at an angle. And that's the most healthy way to sit. So it's, it's the closest thing to sitting on the floor, the way most of the world still sits. Um, do you have an international patent? No, I missed that window. Um, being a bootstrapper, we, we uh, um, couldn't afford to, to maintain and, and take an international patent. Um, so the price, what is the price of the chair right now? Right, it's going to be going up. Um, so now's the time to buy. <laughs> <laughs> so, so the very basic unit is, is six ninety eight. <laughs> and this one, this leather is nine forty eight right now. Um, but we're going to be going up because we've we, um, we've just been underpriced. So. It, um, and people customize them. People have paid as much as twelve, thirteen hundred once they customize the fabric. And so, so for the people that can't afford a chair like this, are you going to offer a, a lesser material or a different model for them? Well, if you'll go to our Etsy.com site, one of the options there is to upcycle an existing chair. So we can sell you, we can sell you the the least expensive right now is is a five hundred dollars. We can sell you the upper this upper section. And then you can upcycle any, it's designed so that you can upcycle any regular office chair that little piston is a standard size. Do you have any with you that we can buy now? Um, <laughs> yes, I, you can, okay. yes, I'm happy to, we'll have to work that out with, um, on the web, but we can, we can certainly send one with so, you. So my suggestion on getting out there is um, I would pick uh, a couple Starbucks like uh, Palo Alto maybe or San Francisco and just put two where all the early adopters and opinion leaders and people that want to both impress their friends with how cool they are and also be more comfortable. Excellent. Um, and then I would also think about uh, you know some of the big trade shows like Consumer Electronics Show or you know pick the particular domain but they've always got little sit around and meet up areas uh, and you get tremendous traffic there. You could just put two chairs there. Um, they'd probably be happy to have them and not charge you, you know, twenty thousand dollars for an exhi exhibition. Oh, excellent! Another idea I had, since you were saying that you wouldn't search per, per se, is to go through the corporate world. So the wellness programs. You had said there was an advocate, so that you get the companies actually buying the chairs for them. And if you have the studies and the statistics to prove the wellness piece, everyone's looking to how to cut down healthcare dollars. So I think that's a really strong um, piece for you. Um, from an individual level, the Skyline Airline Miles, that's the client you're looking for, or the customer who can afford it, so in that industry. Um, and then the other thing is just um, thinking, tying in with RFP 365, looking for government grants who are doing studies or those kinds of things on health and wellness programs. Just a couple of ideas. Well, thank you. Yeah, we did ship uh, last week, we shipped to Walt Disney Corporation. Um, a, the customer, a employee there, their, her hack was an IKEA end table with a pillow. Um, she wasn't willing to sit uh, in the conventional chairs, and so uh, they decided, and a physician prescribed the soul seat. So we're, hopefully we'll, we'll see more of that sort of thing happening. I guess just the addition to that, that was actually sort of my idea as well. Uh, if you award this chair as kind of a prize for winning, because there's a lot of kind of gamification of these health programs, if you kind of position the chair as something that, you know, if you're caring about your health, you know, there's kind of the smoking cessation for insurance premium kind of reduction, but you can kind of place this as this is a prize. And then everybody that's focusing within, especially bigger organizations, might see that as something, hey, I need to get one of these as well. Right, and so it may be kind of your position that this is what you get if you win one of these, and then everybody else that's focused in within the organization is like, hey, that's kind of cool, and then they may cool. come in and kind of, you know. So we locate the out. folks that are coordinating those. Uh, yeah, so so these are there's actually a couple organizations that are kind of hosting these and gamifying the health challenges within organizations. Maybe you could pair with them, okay, have right. that as a prize, and then that may give you a good pathway into how do you actually quantify uh, how these are being used, and so there's kind of a parallel study effect as well. So if they're oh. instrumented, how, and then, I mean, there's also the health insurance. If this actually does have health benefits across a big organization, that may be something like a pedometer or any other indication of level of activity and health that may be interesting to them as well. So Excellent. 
Great, thank you. Yeah, Sensana here in Kent based in Oberlin Park is a great example of how they went out and did their own research to sell their product. And in their product is really a, it's not a relaxation center, it's a, it's a, it's a health um, asset. So Sansana did some wonderful research right off the bat to, to help propel their product across and ended up on the Oprah Winfrey Show to really um, sell the product as well. Okay, thank you. First, you probably need to get this on the view. <laughs> Have the latest. <laughs> yeah, that'd we'll be a good, be. good move. Yeah. Um, and then, is there any way to to produce? Obviously, it's beautiful. The beautifully built, but uh, is there any way to produce it a little bit cheaper in a in a way that you could mass market it? Um, maybe even like smaller that could be combined into like a fold up piece of luggage. Because I, I mean, I want to get this thing in the airports. You got to see people sitting in it, relaxing in in an airport scenario for it to really blow up. Is yeah, what I would say. But I, um, I've got I've got the foldable version on paper. You know, it's it's waiting for the funds to do, you know, sure, to do sure. that. Um, that's a good question. And, and at this point, in order to bootstrap, we have to, we have to market, we have to keep the margins high. So, um, but we've, you know, we've got, we will actually sell you the un upholstered parts and you can work with your own upholster or, or, that you, in your area. There, there are ways to get it less, ex so less expensive. Like, so you'd be able to manufacture it cheaper so that you can freely give it to the places that, that strategically want to have it, you know? So right, you're absolutely right. Did you? Yeah, um, can you repeat the question? Basically, you know, we talked, we talked about sort of your current limitations of manufacturing. Um, so, so when Pack and I first uh, talked, um, we talked about some of the, the current limitations. I mean, Creating one of these is, is it's beautiful, you know, and, and there's a lot of work that goes into it. So what are the current limitations and, and what, where do you need to get to be able to start, you know, really sending these things out? So the, the, the bottleneck on manufacturing is the upholstery. Um, the, the inside, the metal, the wood is, can be cut out by the hundreds on a CNC machine. Um, the, the lower wood parts as well. And we've got metal fabricators that can, you know, we can do them by the hundreds for the, for the core part. But to do good quality uh, upholstery is, is an art form. And so at this point, we don't have a design that's, you know, that's a plastic, that, that's spit out in, you know, soft plastic. So um, that's, and, and, and we're looking for, we're collecting info on, on upholsters and, and folks that can do that all the time. Uh, when, we, when we looked into uh, furniture manufacturers, we got a couple of quotes. Um, and at this point, they're, they're really very high. So sure. uh, it, we're not quite at that threshold where I can order 1,000 and, and get some price break yet. So we'll get you there. Good, good. One word back, zippers. <laughs> zippers. <laughs> zippers for, for the, the, the cover. Yes. Yes. And you mean to take it on and off? In and other words, you, you make the whole thing the same way every time, like you're manufacturing it, but you can put you can buy the covers and they zip on. Exactly. Okay. Yes, yeah, so we have we found, did found someone that can do north of Columbia that that does that they could do that kind of yeah. on site. They wouldn't have to do that. That's an idea. All right, a few more questions. We'll take these two guys and then and then we'll wrap up. Okay, I have two questions. Um, one, can you talk a little bit about the actual science behind the posture and what design decisions you made to you know, make the shape and all of that? And then the second question is, being a maker, have you thought about open sourcing the designs and encouraging people that have the ability to make it themselves to make it themselves? Right, okay. Um, which we have, the, to the second question, we've already sent the parts to someone in uh, Glenview, uh, California, outside on the other side of the bay, and she upholstered her own. So that's an option, we call it the uh, Serious DIY, or do, do uh, yes, the Serious DIY version, and it, she saved a lot of money doing that. So we're, we're willing to do that, and we can, 
we can just send all the parts. Um, the, the design process, I, uh, I was, had been sitting on the floor trying to get flexible for uh, a while, and that was having its limitations. So I decided to bring the floor up. In the first shape, um, I, I just sat down and uh, cross-legged and drew a, a line around me. And the initial shape was a little more, not quite so refined. Um, and, uh, and then as we used it and saw other people use it and, um, and feedback from you know, folks like Rebecca, my wife, who, who needed a, a cutout here in the front. So it was a very iterative process and, and, and required. And the feedback from customers and users and, and early beta testers was really valuable. Uh, so uh, your first question was about how to find, get more people to find that, and a lot of the, the uh, suggestions have been, you know, uh, in person. But what can you tell, tell us what you've done uh, in terms of with your website or any online efforts? What yeah. What have, what have I done with the website? Yeah. Um, or, I, I, I or, built or plans that you have. Yeah. Well, I put it up myself with uh, with Yahoo Site Builder. It's a really, you know, it's a pretty lame website. <laughs> <laughs> but it converts a guy, the guy in Sweden, the day he saw it, he ordered. And we worked out, he emailed and he worked out the shipping and he was willing to pay the, I mean, that was the best compliment. It was a, Swede, a Swede, you know, thought the design. <laughs> he wasn't embarrassed. So, um, so it converts. And if we can get people to the buy button, it's been converting every 40th uh, visit has, has been a sale. Um, but it's a really lame website. I, I, I you know. You also worked with AdWords. And yeah, I've done some AdWords. Uh, we we're on Facebook. Um, I'm not sure much how how much Facebook, uh, you know, converts. But and I had some real good help early on in making sure that we had the right tags and and the back the back end stuff. But we're we're looking now. We're talking with folks about some doing some more deliberate SEO work. So. <coughs> Um, have you done much analysis around the conversion outside that you mentioned that one in 40 convert? No. Okay. I might um, give the thought that you're, you say you have a, a poor website you put together, right? Which I'm sure isn't as bad as you say that it is. Um, no, it's pretty bad. It's Okay, never mind. I'm sure the website is worse than you say it is. You're trying to be nice. I appreciate it. No, but you know, on that note, with a high margin item uh, like this, I don't know what it costs you to actually manufacture one. Uh, you might want to keep in mind that if you spend the smallest amount of money and you can push that needle from you know one out of forty to one out of you know thirty nine or one out of thirty five convert that might very well be that small push of the needle that you, you know, that takes this from a startup to being truly successful, where you now say, hey, I'm profitable, I can spend this much money per lead, and then all of a sudden you have an infinite uh, marketing budget, and you have an infinite pool of money, because if you can go to a bank, you can go to investors, you can say, hey, for every five bucks we put into this, you know, we get 10 out, um, that can be really, really huge. Uh, and I will admit, I did take a quick look at your website just now. Uh, and uh, on a, just a very specific piece of feedback, I noticed that you utilize a PayPal shopping cart. Um, just by switching from a PayPal shopping cart to a standard shopping cart might just give you the push of the needle that you need. Because sure. uh, PayPal actually deters a, a whole lot of e-com shoppers. Yeah. Oh, didn't know that. Okay. Oh. All right, guys. We are out of time, but if anybody wants to help rebuild his website, come see Pact. If you want to stick around, we have a bunch of different soul seats up here to, to try it. Um, everybody, give Pact a huge round of, round of applause. This is amazing. How do you take RFPs? Yeah. <laughs> said, how do you take RFPs? <laughs> uh, C365, I'll set it up. All right. Yeah. all right, guys. Thank you all for coming, and stick around, and try and help these entrepreneurs if you can. Um, feel free to stick around as long as you'd like. <laughs>